Okay. Press the live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Here at Cabinets HR, we're doing a crowdfunding campaign. It'd be great if you could donate and share our, our campaign at https cabinetshr.co slash crowdfunding. Our guest today is Rita Parker. Rita, are you ready to be great today? I, yes, I'm ready. Um, I think so. <laughs> Rita Anthony Parker is a licensed real estate salesperson with EXP Reality, Realty New York. She is also the founder of the Gen Genesis Home that specializes in networking, business support, and development. She just launched the Genesis Home podcast to further her support for the community, businesses, and real estate by talking to local talent and specialists in their industry. So Hi. Rita, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. This is really cool, actually. I really do. This is like a big deal to me. Trust me. So Rita, you're in <laughs> New York City, right? Correct. Um, and so those who don't know, like, and I didn't know this a couple years ago, New York City is not only New York City, but it's like, like some people know it's like Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, but even that's broken out of neighborhoods, right? right. Like you got like Harlem, like um, so Sunset Boulevard, all these different things, right? Exactly. So you have New York City, which is made up of five boroughs. Now, there is a crack, there's a bit of a joke that it says like it's four boroughs because we keep fake, fake forgetting. I think it's like Long Island or Staten Island or one of them, but it's Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island. And within each borough, there are neighborhoods, but the neighborhoods are kind of like baby towns within themselves. So I live in Harlem which is a neighborhood of Manhattan, which is a borough in New York City, which is part of New York State. But Harlem doesn't feel like, if you go further downtown, like Tribeca, they're two different vibes. In fact, Harlem has their own Harlem Council. Most neighborhoods do not have that. So each place has their own vibe. That's why so many places have their own accent. Like mine is totally different than someone who lives in Brooklyn. Because most people think, you know, the big New York City, but actually, when you, when you break it down, all the neighborhoods are like real, little, little small towns, right? With own communities, you know, people see each other every day, and the neighborhood is the neighborhood, right? It's not really this big city Ooh. mentality, is it? No, it's not. That's that's the that's the interesting part behind New York City. New York City is not designed for just one thing. It's designed for a level of diversity, but also creating your own thing at the same time. So that's why. You have, you know, let's just take Manhattan because it's easier and everyone can find it. Harlem is different from Washington Heights. And if anyone knows about, you know, Lynn Miranda, the guy who created Hamilton, he's from Washington Heights, which is above Harlem. But you can feel the difference between Washington Heights, Harlem, uh, like I said, Tribeca, Chelsea. Each neighborhood has their own vibe, which is why most places don't really call them neighborhoods. Sometimes they'll call them towns. Okay. They have like a town-ish vibe to it. And give us a sense how big NYC actually is. Like suppose someone is going to travel from Coney Island and Southern Brooklyn up to where you're at. How long would that take to uh, drive or be on the train? If you're driving, it's going to take you about 45 minutes. By train, it's going to take you about two hours and 15. Okay. From where I'm at to Coney Island. All right. And, and you're born and raised there? Yes, I was born in the Bronx, which is a borough above Manhattan, and I was raised in Manhattan. My mom is from upstate New York, which is a whole different land unto itself. <laughs> <laughs> so in New York City, it was one of, the, one of the epicenters of COVID, right? How is it, how is it there right now? Mm -hmm. Is it like, is it like, is the news that we're accurate or what's going on there or is it completely different? The... <sighs> So the interesting thing is you have what is the general news of New York State. Each part of the state is different. So New York City, we're not fully up and running. There are pockets that are better than others. But compared to last year, I would say there's an improvement. Um, upstate New York is actually ahead than we are because there's less people up there and there's more space and obviously. but in general, I will say the state is doing well. The city's gonna take some time in forms of recovery. But the beautiful thing about New York City itself is that we're a global city. 
So we're, so you have, you know, London, you have, there's always money coming into the city. So there's always opportunities for New York City to thrive and survive this. So that's the beautiful thing. The only thing I can see that would be an issue for a lot of people, and they're talking about that now, is the numbers. I mean, there's roughly 8.5 million people that live in New York City alone. So last year we had the, last year was like the real hit, the real episode of the pandemic. So you have 8.5 million people in a state that altogether is like 13.5 million people. That is a lot for someone who lives in the South and they're moving up to the North. So they, I think people are just trying to figure things out, but New York's a lot more resilient than the news kind of portrays us. And that's just my opinion from that and from what I've seen. So, of course, New York City has all this tourist stuff to do, like Times Square, the Statue of Liberty, on and on, Broadway. But what is something someone to go visit that maybe not be like maybe tourists here, like something that only New Yorkers know about? If I had to pick something, yeah, I would definitely try the Bronx. Arthur Avenue has an amazing row of, it- of Italian restaurants and bakeries. That is not a common place most people visit, which is sad in my opinion. Another good place, this, I don't know if people are that morbid or that historically curious, <laughs> but in Brooklyn, there is a cemetery. And during like the 1800s to the early 1900s, it used to be a dating spot. And they still have some of those chairs <laughs> and you can still do picnics there. <laughs> that's definitely different. So these, that's it's different. Um, another good spot, which most people don't think of, is Columbia University. Columbia University is actually, even though most people don't realize this, is part of what they call the inclusive transition. So there was a, and my grandfather was part of that for a minute. There, um, they start accepting more black or people of color in programs that are associated with science and engineering. And it was around the time World War I, World War II, you started seeing more people like that. And they have like a strip of people, like, a, like this like shrine dedicated to those people who were part of that transition. So the colleges are great. The cemeteries are cool. <laughs> Take a look at the Bronx. <laughs> That's crazy. But these are things, don't, and we have trails. We actually do have hiking trails in New York City. Most people don't know that. And a lot of people think the Central Park, but you all have like several more parks out of Central Park, right? Yes, we have um, there's St. Nicholas Park. There's Morningside Park. That list can go on forever. The most popular is Central Park, but Central Park is actually, if you feel like, like I said, these are things that are more common with people who are interested in history, but Central Park wasn't always Central Park. Central Park used to be its own town. Central Park is relatively new in the history of New York. It used to be a community, and then that community got relocated is the safety sentence we're using today, <laughs> and Central Park was built. But there's lots of great parks. You got Morningside Park. You got, you know, there's um, Brooklyn has a great, they're mostly known for their nature because it's huge. Brooklyn used to be a city. Remember, all these boroughs used to be cities. They didn't become, you know, boroughs until late 1800s, early, like, this is all new boroughs, the, the, um, the modern definition of the public transportation system. All of this used to be separate entities. They were never one big unit. They all had their own, you know, they had a governor. We've always had a governor, but they had their own mayors. They had their own boards. They had their own budget. All of this is within like a hundred years, so, which is not commonly known. How competitive are the boroughs for each other? Like the Queens and Brooklyn competing to each other for bragging rights or whatever, or how does that go? So how it really goes is, and today or then? Um, <laughs> today. Both, both, both. Okay, so and then each city had their own territories, and therefore they had their own mayors and they had their own policies. What they did was they set up their own public transportations and they used what is called 
transportation rights to bridge between the two now established boroughs. Now it's a little convoluted. Most of the historical society is really good at explaining it, but what it's called is a unified constitution, something like that. And that's when all the girls got together and they got connected and that's how they did their thing. So Rita, for yourself, you, you started several companies in the past. So you're what I guess called a, a serial entrepreneur. What got you, got you started on being an entrepreneur? What started you on that path versus like working a regular nine to five? Why, why the entrepreneurship journey for you? So it really wasn't a linear thing. It actually started when I was a child. My my mom's a single parent. I mean, I have a nice network of family, but I was mostly raised by my mom. And she kind of raised me to be more of a partner in crime. So she taught me how to manage a house. <laughs> she taught me how to budget. She taught me the importance of, you know, how to manage a home, but also how to manage like outside interest. So not only was I helping her in the house, I was also helping her in, you know, her businesses. My mother was not just a teacher, but she was also a tutor and she also ghost wrote. She was also a ghost writer. And I would help her with that. And then when I got older, I started acquiring more responsibility. So it really started the home. And then I stopped for a while and did the, let me go into retail and see how I feel about that and working for the man. You know, not to be, not to be like, you know, sarcastic, but I sucked at it. I was really, really bad. <laughs> Even though I was a manager at a lot of these places, I sucked at it, partly because I didn't have a voice. And I learned that as an entrepreneur, you, you one, create your own platform and you create your own foundation, but you learn to be an advocate at the same time because you got to have to fight for your brand. You got to advocate for your team. You have to learn to cultivate a culture and that's really where I learned the responsibilities of being an entrepreneur. I learned the logistics from my mom, but the, but the embrace of that environment stemmed for the fact I no longer wanted to work for somebody. I wanted to be the support system for these people. That's really how the story went. Like I said, I'm, I'm pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> no. So what, what, what makes you such a good entrepreneur? Is it just a drive within you? Is it like your ideas? Like what, what makes you so good at what you do? I don't make it about me. I think that's what, what makes it why I love what I do. It's not about me at all whatsoever. It's about you. It's about my client. It's about the teams that I work with. It's about you know, the, anything I create, I create for someone. So therefore what I, what makes me love what I do or continue it as a career is knowing that it has nothing to do with me. I just contribute to someone else's thing. I like being behind the scenes. So that's really how I motivate my entrepreneurial base or my culture is knowing that it's not about me. It's about the community that I cultivate or the products that I serve to help these people. So from, that's for me. From your point of view, what's, what's some, what are some pros and cons of being an entrepreneur? From my perspective, I think one is being public. I have to be the face of the business, which is not fun for me naturally. I kind of like my little private life. Um, another con would possibly be the idea of a brand. I'm not a, I was, I, I have a lot of old school mentality in my head that I don't believe in the idea of the brand. I believe in the idea of the culture because I was raised that whatever you do, you're building a legacy. And what would that legacy be like when you're not around? And I don't mean not around, I'm not trying to be morbid, but like if I'm on a cruise or something, <laughs> what would that be like? So the, that's the pro, but the con is the brand thing, the image part. If I can do everything in my sweats and relax, I would. Um, but there's a lot of pros to it. I get to meet some amazing people. I learn so much about myself 
boundaries are definitely a pro in, in when you're an entrepreneur because there's certain things you just can't handle. You just, it doesn't fit what you have to do or the career you're trying to pursue. I get to be, and this is a pro in my, my opinion, I get to be of service. Part of, in my, in my view of being an entrepreneur is that you're of service of this industry or this, you know, mission or this question you're trying to address. You know, that how do you, in my case, if you're new to real estate or new to business, what are these resources that you should have at your disposal that you don't have automatically? That's where Genesis comes in. It helps businesses slowly, <laughs> but it helps businesses feel more confident knowing they have a team and they have a support system. I feel comfortable knowing that this product or service will have that support system and feel confident to grow. And it doesn't require me to be this visible. It requires them to be this visible because that's their service. I just have their back. So that's a pro to me. You bring up a good point. I think too many people start companies because, oh, I want to be a millionaire. I want to be rich. Oh, I don't have an idea. I'll make something up right. Now I realize that you don't have that passion, you know, because people don't realize how long this journey takes, right? If you don't have that passion for it, you're going to quickly quit and, and go by the wayside. So you got to be And it's emotional. Something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. De very definitely. It is. There's days where you're wondering, why did I do this? But then you look at, that's why it's so important that you have like the little victories in between this. Like today, um, we had um, a client of mine that I, when I first started in real estate was having a problem getting an apartment. Now he's telling me he's looking at a house and he needs help with that. That's because those little steps that he took might have not gotten an apartment in New York, but would probably get him a house in Pennsylvania. So it's those little victories that really, in my opinion, keep, keeps us going as entrepreneurs. Yeah. I remember a while ago, they did an interview with Elon Musk and Elon Musk had just like launched a, a space rock. He does like did something really spectacular, right? He's like really on the, the ground, like to get a lot of favorable press. And, and the guy asked, well, how are you doing Elon Musk? He said, I'll be honest with you, my love sucks right now. It's not good to be me, right? But as everyone's like, how's it suck to be you? You're the greatest guy ever. But as an entrepreneur, you immediately knew, okay, you know what he's going through, right? Something's right, not right with Elon because entrepreneur journey, right? You, you know, as an entrepreneur, like you see all this like front end stuff, I call it, you know, doing podcasts, doing branding, doing this and that. But the regular people don't see the back and like, they don't see all the, the stuff that sucks, so to speak, right? And I just think that's an interesting point. Yeah, and they don't see this, and a lot of things, they don't see the sacrifice. To get to where Elon Musk is at right now required him to make certain decisions that we probably don't have to face yet. So for him, he may not be okay. You know, like I said, this is an emotional thing, which is why I try to make it my mission that if I ask anyone, no matter if it's the pandemic or not, are you okay? Because if you're not okay, my mom said the outside and inside need to match. <laughs> if you're not okay, nothing that you do will match that. So he's right. You know, just because you have all of this doesn't mean that you're, you, the way you feel with your spouse yourself internally matches all this beautiful things. Yeah, no, I think I'm going to use, I'm going to spill that for most of asking people, is your, does your inside match your outside right now? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one right there. A lot of times that's the best way to explain outside. it. A lot of times people's inside don't match their outside. A lot of times. They don't. And you can see that a lot, especially on social media. And you and I both are on social media. And you see it all the time, people with these pretty cars and these fast homes and all this other pretty, you know what I mean? Reverse that fast cars, pretty houses, whatever. And they're depressed or they're, you know, in reality, they don't have any of that stuff. You know, it's all of it's just, you know, a smoke screen. But if you are comfortable with yourself knowing, you know, that this journey is going to be complicated at best it makes the downtimes of those little valleys 
you know, a little more manageable. And I think for Elon or for anyone, because they did a, a, a few weeks ago, there was an Oprah interview with Harry and Megan. And they said, and Megan said that she was struggling, struggling with her mental health. And people going, how is she struggling with her mental health? She lives in this house. She has this husband. She has this baby. She says, you're looking at the external. Don't do that. It's, there's, there's sacrifices going on behind the scenes to get these external things there's a lot of there's a process for everything and part of that is your mental health so he's right and I think as entrepreneurs we don't have those conversations enough that it does take a toll on us emotionally it does sometimes you do need to step back and chill Rita so and you're, you're an actual real estate agent also correct Correct. So how does one become a real estate agent? You just like wake up one day, I'm Jason Cabinets, we start selling <laughs> homes, you know, like do an ad, like you, 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 like, you have to do like some type of school or degree, like how does that even work, right? So here's the beautiful thing. I'm licensed. You have to get a license or a certification depending on the state, but the general rule is license, certification, meet these certain requirements, and you have what is called an affiliate license, which basically means that you are connected to a brokerage. In my case, it's eXp Realty. It's cloud-based, which means I don't have to be at an office. I can do it anywhere around the world. As long as I'm licensed in New, well, licensed by New York State, I can be in Canada and still sell New York real estate. So that's a beautiful thing. And my shameless plug for eXp. <laughs> But it's really, a, it's depending on the state, it's usually the process of a certain number of hours for classes and training, certification, state exam, brokerage. Now, this is where things get weird. And I've had this conversation multiple times. If you've been in real estate to a certain period for a certain amount of time, independent on the state you're with, you can actually move up. You can be a broker. A broker is someone who can essentially hang their own shingle and start their own team. Well, not start their own team, but start their own team is one part that they can also create their own brokerage. That is a little more education, a little more time, depending on the state. It can also be a financial aspect to it. But that's essentially how it works. It's just training. It's just like, I'm not going to say just like, but it's similar to getting your cosmetology license. You know, you have to go to school for that. You have to get some training. You have um, apprenticeships and then you go take your exams. You know, once you get your license, you have to like keep update with different like trainings and stuff and certifications or once you're a real estate license, you, that's it. it. No, it is a continuing education process. You are always in school. This is what I tell anyone who's interested in any specialty. It could be HR, it can be cosmetology, it can be real estate, it can be a plumber. Anything involving a skill set, you still have to continue learning about that skill set. It is not this one and done thing that people think is happening. You know, there are teachers out there that are still going to school so they can get so they can learn their craft. There are actors and actresses and people in the entertainment industry that are learning all the time. Anything that involves nurturing a career will involve education. And unless you are comfortable with education and uncomfortable with knowledge, you will not succeed in that career. And do you think focus mainly on NYC or you, or you do real estate across the United States? I am my license in New York state, but I do specialize in, um, national relocation, which means anyone who wants to move from, let's say, Seattle, <laughs> Seattle to New Jersey, I can help them with that. So what would you tell someone who says, you know, I'm about to sell my house by myself. I don't need a real estate agent. I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to waste my money on, the, on them, you know, on, on, a, on the sales. I'll just do it myself. See, I'm a weird agent because most people will go, well, you could do that. But here's the thing. You have Zillow. You have for sale by owner.com. You have all these books out now. I do not view myself as a traditional salesperson. I view myself as a consultant. So if someone says, I want to sell my house on my own, 
It's like, okay. But this is what I would recommend. Having what is called an agent incentive, which basically means try to find people or try to find, like have like a percentage for that agent that's going to find you the client to buy your house. So that way you're not doing the work. All these agents are going to do it for you. But you still don't have a licensed agent on your thing. You have more autonomy and control. Um, I would try to keep up to date if they have any questions. But I would never force someone to sell their house or I would never force someone to hire an agent because the world has changed so drastically that the definition of a traditional agent has also changed. It is no longer the salesperson. It is now more of an advisor. It's now more of a guide, okay? And some people want a listing agent, which is what it's popularly called, because they want that guidance on retainer, okay? Some people don't want that guidance on retainer. All I know is if you're going to sell your home on your own, please just do it safely. Um, I would recommend going virtual. Do not market anything that has sellable items in it so if there's just, if people see like a big screen tv or jewelry remove it before you take the photos the only thing i do recommend for people is to hire is to um get an interior designer consultation that's the only thing i recommend for people and the reason why i say interior designers because they're great at staging which is very important in selling your property but i don't i'm not i don't force people to do anything they don't want to do for someone who does want to get a real estate agent, how do you recommend they, they find the right one for them? It's about personality and it's about relationship. Uh, there are some that are very analytical and they focus more on the logistics of selling a property. Some are very great storytellers. You know, I've seen that. And I think enough people who watch Bravo have seen that too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they, or any HDTV type things have seen that as well. Um, so it's really down to the relationship. Some of the, you can get, there are people who are been in this business for 20 years, have competed against people who've done this for like three minutes. And the kid with the three minutes can outbeat the guy who's done it for 20 years because the kid fits the personality or, the, or that relationship of the client. The clients think in emotions. Agents respect that and know how to act accordingly. So suppose someone has a real estate agent. When should someone change real estate agent? Like, should it be like, like, okay, you haven't sold my house in six weeks or six months, or you get offers way lower than I think you begin. Like when should a person move on to another real estate agent? Or, or do you, once you pick one, you want to stick with them until the house sells? You can switch agents. Um, there are popular options with that. You can allow the agent to recommend another agent within that brokerage. You can make it in what is called a, a change in agency, which basically makes it an open listing. So anyone can sell it within that brokerage or within that state. Or, you know, you can, um, if you don't want to do any of that, just say, you know what, I don't think this is working. Da, da, da. Now, here's the thing that most people do not understand. If you have a problem selling your house, it could be one or two reasons. Okay, people say it's three, but it's usually commonly two. One, you overpriced your house. If you live in a market that is on average three, 250 per home in your neighborhood and you're charging 500K, that's a little much. Or it can be another extreme where you're, you priced it too low. Once again, still at 250 and you priced it at 96,000. What's wrong with yeah. the house? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you're saying it's perfect. If it's perfect, why is it 96? So that's usually the common thing. The other thing could also be agents, um, you know, seller standards and things like that can be a little much, you know, some people who, and this is, if you want a real, real, real funny story, I got one for you that would just like go, what? Started in real estate, I had my first listing and I will never forget this listing as long as I live. 
the it was a duplex out in Queens. The husband was very sweet. The wife was kind in her own way, but she kind of had this celebrity A-list standards for what she was looking for in a buyer. She was like, well, this building, you need, you need someone who has certain kinds of class. I'm like, you do realize this is a story. This is like, most of these people have like kids and they're like soccer moms and not like, you know, these are not like you're living on like Madison Avenue. It's just, yeah. But and nothing went too hard to like She had like this, like literally she had like a list of people or a list of standards that she had for people that would buy her duplex. I'm going, I had explained to her by law, I can't discriminate. So if Tom Cruise's assistant, who's a Scientologist Catholic, decides <laughs> to look at the place and buys it, I have to present you that offer. Even though he may not like the fact that she's a Scientologist Catholic of Tom Cruise, it's it's by law. I have to present that to you. Yes. She goes, is that how that works? Said, yeah, that's how that works. <laughs> So what ended up happening, we ended up selling it, but what we did was what we call a short sale. And what that, what that entails is she found, we found someone that would buy it off of her to cover something she wanted covered attached to, which was in her case was a mortgage. So instead of putting it on the market in a traditional way, we got like her cousin to buy her out. So it ended up turning out well, <laughs> but the whole process of her and she had like five pages worth of standards of the type of buyer she wanted for that place and I couldn't even qualify like I didn't even need it because I would have been considered too ghetto because I'm from because I was born in the Bronx and I was raised in Harlem so for her Harlem and the Bronx were a little bit rough around the edges and I am the epitome of rough around the edges. So <laughs> it just it wouldn't have fit. But she loved me. So what we did was we did the short sale. So her cousin bought her out. And we got her a smaller place um, in upstate New York. But once again, it's that relationship. But there's been some crazy, like, if, if agents could talk and had, like, their own deaf comedy jam type tour, <laughs> it would be hilarious. So Rita, is there a advantage or disadvantage of buying like brand new construction versus an older home? Or does that, does that matter? It does. Um, when it's an older home, it's a lot more maintenance, but you have the longevity. For newer construction, you don't know the story yet. It's new, so everything's new, but it's new. So the management probably is still trying to figure out the kinks. You still have, you know... You know, they're still updating those requirements. They probably went too low in the maintenance fees or in the seller fees. You know, there's a thing now in New York where, and I'm learning about it right now, where there, some of the properties are going digital currency, like Bitcoin and everything. And some people love it. Some people hate it because Bitcoin, it depends on how, many, how much money is put into it for those values to go up, for that value to go up. And newer properties, that's more popular and older properties is not. But some properties are not happy with the Bitcoin system because Bitcoin can, can fluctuate. So this pros and cons to everything. Now, if I had to pick a model, I would go older, partly for the resale value and partly because there's a character to it that newer developments do not have yet. What are some of the channels of, of the New York City real estate market? Because it's like its own, our own market, right? With own, own entry fees and different things going on. New York is one of the most expensive real estate markets in the world. New York City. I'm not going to say state. New York City is one of the most expensive real estate markets in the world. I mean, you, I mean, you, can, I mean, you can find like a thousand square foot apartment for like 2000 a month, right? Or something crazy like that, right? If you're lucky. That's nice. That's a good dream. <laughs> <laughs> it is really expensive, but it is worth it if you're coming to New York for the right intentions. You know, if you plan on coming here for your retirement, eh, 
But if you're coming here to, you know, get on your grind and start something or start a career and you need New York resources to get there, have fun. You know, that's really what this is. Now, what makes New York so expensive? People say it's the taxes. It's really not the taxes that makes New York expensive. It's the image. Now, we have Broadway, we have Harlem, we have, remember we mentioned all these neighborhoods. That's what makes New York expensive is the image. It's kind of like an iPhone. As much as I love my iPhone now, I didn't always love it. Basically what you're buying is the, the ambiance of New York. So when someone says I'm buying 500, I want a $500,000 apartment, which essentially means a studio here in Manhattan, <laughs> a two bedroom if you're lucky in the Bronx and a one to two bedroom everywhere else. Cause it's, it, it's funny if you get a one bedroom here in Manhattan for 500K anything. It's essentially because of that neighborhood or that environment. So if you don't have a problem with the New York City environment or the New York State environment, then New York's for you. That's really how, why everything's so expensive. It's kind of like California. Even though the taxes are high, part of the reason why California works is because it's California. I mean, how many shows, um, businesses, tech, what, what California brings is why it's so high and expensive. Same thing with New York. We have the arts. We have, you know, even if you don't live in the city, you live in upstate, you have amazing, you know, land and water and you're so close to Canada that you can actually get some really good food. You know, there's so many things that come with this. Plus New York is part of what's called the tri-state area, which is New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. So you're near so much. So it's the accessibility that people like when it comes to New York and people are willing to pay top prices for that accessibility. And speaking of food, I, I, I'll probably make this number up, but I remember reading somewhere that you could actually eat like 10,000 different places, different restaurants and not eat the same place like twice. Right. There's so many restaurants in New York city. You could actually like, like something like crazy number, like three, four, five, 10,000 nights in a row. And this is foodie heaven. Food. This is foodie heaven. You can go, that you can, if you love donuts, there's like a thousand different donut shops. That's not counting like what people bake in their homes to sell. <laughs> you know, there's food trucks, there's different cultures. You could actually eat your way through New York and not visit the same place multiple times. Yeah. So Rita, let's talk about your Genesis Home Network. So from my point of view, you combine real estate, which is probably the the anti-startup mentality with what they say, like basically a startup, right? So how you combine these two different things, right? Real estate is like, you know, not really the most startup -y thing you do in the world, you know, versus the Genesis Home Network, right? How are you, how are you making this work? So this is going to be an interesting way to explain it. I try to eliminate excuses as much as I can. Real estate is a unique industry. It is not for the faint of heart. OK, so you have, you know, so many people, you have so many standards, so much requirements, things like that. As an agent and as someone who have seen people buy businesses and commercial real estate, it's daunting. So my logic was and still is, how do we bridge this impenetrable industry, which is not true at all, <laughs> to help people who can do great things for this industry. So I worked backwards. I didn't focus on the real estate first. I focused on the business first. And I learned about business to business marketing and networking. And that's the first thing I learned after I got my license. I learned how do I partner up with businesses and help them succeed? And, and work with their clients or their staff. So when I first got my license, that's the first thing I learned. I learned business to business marketing, business to business content, business to business, you know, communication. How do I work with businesses to help them grow? Because 
real estate is not conducive for businesses. Real estate is conducive for the individual. So I'm supposed to help specifically you. You know, I'm supposed to help Jason. I'm not supposed to help Cavanus HR. I didn't like that. Actually, I hated it. It just didn't fit what the potential for that license or for that industry and for the resources that we get on a regular basis. Okay, because not only do I have access to residential property, I have access to commercial. I have a network of agents. It doesn't make sense why these two can't work together to achieve great things. So I started Genesis one to build up my own network because I didn't have any. I didn't know anyone in real estate and I didn't know anyone beyond real estate. I didn't even have an attorney's address. <laughs> you know, I had like nothing. So when I say I started from scratch, I started from scratch. Like no one, I had like two managing brokers that were really sweet and took me on, but I really did not have a network that I needed to do a listing or to talk to a client. The great thing is, I said, how do I make this work that helps everybody? And that's how Genesis happened. Genesis is essentially the beginning. It's a little biblical, but that's really what it translates into. How, do, how does this relationship create something that's new or the beginning of something? So like, for example, when I met you, I literally started real estate like two days after I met you. Like The timing was so weird. That's really what happened. I got my license and then met you two days later. But you and I were kind of in the same boat. Like, how do we make these things happen? And you were super supportive in helping my clients understand, like, their resumes and helping me, like, test things out <laughs> and stuff like that. It didn't make sense that we couldn't grow together. And that's essentially the theory behind Genesis and the theory about how this bridge between real estate and business can work. And then you have the client factor, that person in the middle, that remember what I said in the beginning, that person in the middle who doesn't have that kind of support system. So you and I together can help this person achieve great things, knowing that they don't have to worry about the HR and training, knowing that they don't have to worry so much about the logistics behind finding a property, knowing that they don't have to worry about finding an attorney. These little things add up, but these little things also help build confidence because they're saying, I can walk into this, this office and know that I got a team because I got Jason and I got Rita and I got this. You know, it's, it really does change how people perceive their businesses and their careers and their goals. And that's so, really what it is. So who is your, like, do you have like a, is there like a target customer for your platform? At first, it was other agents because we were all struggling at the same time. <laughs> so other new agents and mostly startups were really the, the target at the time. But now it's more about social entrepreneurs is more my target base. People who are interested in being more of an educator, less of a dictator. I've seen them. They scare me. And I don't, I don't see people succeeding in business if you're telling them what to do. Uh, people who are interested in buying or interested in investing, but don't necessarily have the, the confidence yet and they just need the teddy bear. I know that sounds really kiddie-ish, but that's the best way to explain it. <laughs> you know, and businesses like yours and mine, you know, that just need someone to bounce ideas off of and have some fun and, you know, hey, I got this thing going on. Can you come check it out? You know, just really cultural, supportive, community-based, you know, we're all in this together. And with the pandemic, it really does highlight that it has to be a grassroots community effort for us to survive. And I think, in my opinion, Genesis reflects that, that it has to be, it's the people on the ground that shapes the community. It's the small businesses that shape the community. And it's also how we work together that makes those great things happen. I know it's a little naive, but that's really how I see it. 
So since you started the Genesis Home Product Network, what are some things you've learned from, from growing the network that you didn't know before? What I didn't know before was how competitive everyone, not about the businesses, but how people feel about each other. They think competition is a, is a, competition was really a big part of it. And I'm not saying competition with like Genesis versus LinkedIn or anything like that. I mean, competition in terms of how we view ourselves in this, in this world and how we view ourselves in business. Like you're not my competition. I don't view you as my competition. Even though we're both looking for clients, we're both looking for clients for two different reasons. I don't view the other agents as my competition. The only competition I have is me. So from the biggest thing I will say was mindset that, that I learned the hard way is how people view themselves and how they view their business. That was a big lesson. Another big lesson is I had to be, I had to learn how to be more vocal. That scared me. I faced a lot of fears building Genesis. You know, I had to want to be more vocal. I had to be, I had to find a way to network while maintaining my, my long-term mission of support. You know, there was a lot of things that I had to, to face. A lot of it was image-based. You know, I had to be more comfortable, which once again, these are things that I never thought that I would have to face in my life. You know, I always saw these people like with these AIs and everything. I always thought I would be like, you know, a, a cartoon or something. And the cartoon, like Victoria's Secret, would be <laughs> the face of Genesis. That's not what happened. So that would probably be the, the most the comp mental competition which really doesn't exist and facing my fears would probably be the hardest things that I had to deal with even now when it comes to growing and building Genesis. So Rita, so we're both introverts and you know, the stereotype is, you know, business owners, entrepreneurs, like extroverts, you know, they're like Steve jobs out there doing stuff. How have you like been able to, you know, to take advantage of being introvert or overcome being introvert and, and put yourself out there and, and be the brand that you are? The podcast helps out a lot. The podcast really allows me to ask the questions I've always wanted to ask, but were too shy to ask. That's one way. Um, so my, my network, my personal network of amazing people, like, you know, talking to you and some of the friends that I've, that I've met along the way really do help with confidence. Um, writing. You know, you know, when people ask, I have, I keep like a little blog every so often and I'll write about what my opinions and things like that. That helps with my brand branding <laughs> and um, building of my confidence. I am an introvert and I think people will be surprised. A lot of people are in, in as an entrepreneur. And I think that's what makes them great entrepreneurs, that they are introverts, that they can do more in the shadows sorry, the Batman parlance, but they can do more, you know, behind the scenes because they know that the minute they step out there, it has to make an impact. Um, another, a beautiful example of that, and people will probably know her, is Rihanna. Rihanna is an introvert. She is, she talks about it all the time. She hates doing interviews. She, <laughs> she hates going on stage. She hates the whole thing. But Every time she goes on stage, every time she does an interview, she tells them she does a lot of prep work before that time. So I think for us as introverts, it makes what we do all the more important because we do so much work behind the scenes to make that impact. For Genesis to work, there's a lot of work that goes into it behind the scenes. For you know, even I'm, I have my hoodie on, I have a Genesis hoodie on. There was a lot of prep work for this little simple hoodie. <laughs> okay. So I think as introverts, it has a unique 
talent that with all due respect, extroverts don't have. We know how to make that one moment last. We know how to make a service something that people will not forget because we took all this time to make that happen. So if that answers your question in any way, that's how I view my introvert talents Lita, and what I do with it. What's your long-term vision for the Genesis Network? So I had this question like a few years ago and I kind of was a little marvel about it. I still am marvel about it. My goal, my long-term goal is to actually have a Genesis camp. Kind of like, um, I'm a huge Marvel fan. So clearly I love Tony Stark. I love the Avengers, the whole thing since I was a kid. In the comics, Tony Stark actually has a compound for the Avengers. And they do their training, they do their businesses and everything on that compound. My goal, long-term goal is to have something like that. A place where judgment free, no drama, but people can work together. They can learn from each other. There's a school there so they can learn about like certain business techniques and practices that are normally not covered in your traditional MBA classes. Okay, there are things that are not covered in your MBA classes. There are things that are not covered in traditional college and are not covered in traditional institutions. And I've always wanted something like that. I've always thought that was the coolest thing ever. And, I've, and that's really my, my goal. My goal is to have that. Not that crazy, because that's insane. And the maintenance on that kind of will make me cry. But <laughs> something similar to that, a place where you don't have to be on 24 seven where you can just figure things out and practice your craft or a new product or service. Um, we work was a great idea in the sense that they have, they open the door to collaborations. The issue with WeWork is that it's very restrictive in the sense that it's largely rental based. It doesn't have the same community aspect that I'm looking for. I want something that if someone's doing something in tech that maybe legal would be interested in, let's test it out in legal. So that's really my goal and really my, no, not a dream. That's my goal. That's what I want. I want, I want that. <laughs> So let's talk about your podcast. Your podcast is, is, is pretty new one, right? How did that come about and why did you start it? And has that been fun for you so far? The podcast started sooner than I anticipated, <laughs> but the podcast started out of a way to introduce small businesses and people in the community to the, the, the country. I think the, the politics and everything, I think we've lost our way as a, as a society. We're so bogged down by these differences of opinion that we, we are not really listening to each other. So I started the podcast to introduce or reintroduce the people on the ground, you know, the author, the writers, the agents, the HR specialists, the people who really shape our communities, our cities, our, our towns. Okay. And and there's other podcasts on there. You're on, you were on there. <laughs> yes, yeah. um, and that's essentially where it came from. And it, it further stretches that point for Genesis about building a community, supporting businesses, you know, letting people know that these things exist and they're within your reach. Um, last week or a couple of weeks ago, I had a managing broker, a broker on record on there to cover the topic of what's called compliance. Cause in, when you're a real estate agent, you have to make sure that your paperwork's legit and you're not, you know, being slimy or sketchy. <laughs> so we had a, what is called a broker on record which is a lady who signs all the papers to make sure we're not, you know, slimy or sketchy. And we discuss compliance. We discuss what that process is like because that is a common issue with people who wanna work with agents. 
how does that process work where if I'm giving you my house or my apartment or my condo or land or whatever, how are you being held accountable? Because accountability was a big topic. So this is how we're being held accountable. You know, I had a, a, uh, another real estate agent on there and she was, she's also an artist. You know, she's an actress, an actress, Hooper. <laughs> she's an actress. And we discussed how does she bridge being an actress, an actress in the arts with real estate. And she talked about the importance of prepping and communication and language. So these are people who are in your, these are people in your neighborhood. These are people in your backyard. You know, you have photographers and you have so many talented people, but in, but it's all caught up in this noise that makes absolutely no sense. So that's really where the podcast came from. How do we ignore the noise and just focus on the cool people on the ground and you, thank them? Do you have, do you have like a dream guest that you want to reach out to one day and, and like have on your podcast, like a reach guest or dream guest, like. If I can pull this off, I know I'm doing something right. So I crossed off roughly three people already as my dream guest. <laughs> Oddly enough, um, you were one. Uh, Tanisha E was another. Uh, Fanny Montavo was one, and then there was the person who brought me off for EXP. Now my dream guest like if if i had like this this perfect guest that i would love to have what's his name it's an, um he actually owns the weather channel <laughs> oh, wow that's random <laughs> his, <laughs> his, and if if i can if um he he owns the channel and he found and he's one of the he oh wow and the funny thing is i just thought about him like two seconds ago byron allen byron allen if okay I can get he, byron, he, he, yeah he does own the weather channel i forgot about that <laughs> he owns the weather channel and he was on the breakfast club and he was talking about how byron allen became byron allen and part of the thing he said was about his mom and he has this incredible respect for, you know, single moms and single parents and everything. But he started out as a comedian. And now he's practically a mogul and he is like on my TV all the time because we always check the weather report. So, <laughs> so if I can pick like my dream person it would probably be Byron Allen. I would love Byron Allen on my podcast. I would, that would be really cool. What advice do you have for brand new entrepreneurs? Like someone just starting out, they have an idea, they're trying to figure this out. They don't have a logo yet. They have no clue what they're doing, but they have that, they, they want to start a company. What advice do you have for them? What do you want to do? It's really the biggest question. Please do not go into entrepreneurship thinking that it's just going to come to you. It's really not the greatest idea. I've seen it. It ends badly. If you don't have a question you want to answer or a mission that you have or something, um, the great thing about entrepreneurs, they fill a void somewhere, okay? For HR, you're filling a void for small businesses that normally don't have the budget for those kind of resources. Genesis fills the void for people who are trying to figure out how to build the businesses that they already are trying to start to keep in the wall. Or for new agents, as when I started, needed that network or support. What void are you trying to fill? And how do you plan on filling that? And what are you willing to give up to fill that void? I know that sounds like a really morbid way to explain that, but you're, you're essentially giving up something for something. You know, when I went into real estate and when I started Genesis, I gave up time. You know, as much as I love my family and I love my friends, it's a lot of work <laughs> and a lot of time and a lot of reading and a lot of research and a lot of education. What are you willing to give up to pursue that, to fill in that void? And if you don't know what you're going to give up, don't fill the void, sell it. I've had people who literally would take an idea, create the business plan and just sell it. 
because he knows he, she, it, or they, whatever, will never fulfill it, but the idea is great and it will fill a void. But don't do anything if there's nothing, there's no passion or commitment behind it. This is a relationship. Entrepreneurship is a lifestyle. Entrepreneurship's a relationship. So if you don't see yourself part of that relationship, don't get into it. Rita, so that's my advice for people who are new. As an entrepreneur, you don't get so much advice from people, right? And and most of it is like good intent, you know, but it's from that person's lens. It might it might be the right advice for you. And there are a few scammers out there, right? A few con artists, so to speak, right? As an entrepreneur, how do you like walk through all this feedback and advice from different people and like and pick what's good or what's good? Or you just, I mean, how do you go up? How do you tell people to do about it, right? Because there's so much advice out there. Like I said, some good, some bad, some is good intent, but you know, not good for you, right? How do you how do you work through all that? One, I think of timing. Two, consider the source. If the source of that person, if the person who's giving you the advice is not, is a form of projection, be polite to everyone. Say thank you for your insight. It's just a bringing. <laughs> okay. But if it but always consider the source. If that person is really giving advice as to make some money, then that advice is not really genuine to me. Okay, there's, there's always something attached to it. So if I'm gonna say, like when, I, when you, like I said, you and I have had plenty of conversations. I've asked you for your advice plenty of times. Okay, the, I know when I'm asking for your advice, it's because I genuinely see the work you've put into it and the time you put into it. So when I ask you these things, it's because I know the advice I'm getting is someone who's either had these experiences or has an idea. Now, for someone who's trying to fake the funk, I'm a New Yorker, leave me alone. <laughs> someone who's trying to fake the funk or trying to force an image, I don't take them as seriously because once again, that has nothing to do with me. It has to do with their projection onto what they would do if they had it their way. And I take issue with that. But I thank them for their opinion. I listen accordingly, but I don't internalize it. I don't take it to the business. I just respect it because they are entitled to their opinion. Like I've had people tell me, Rita, just go for your broker's license. Just just go for it. So that's great. But I have like, like so many things on my to-do list right now that broker's license is number like 23. It is not number one. But I respect them for it because they see a potential there. But for me right now at this stage of Genesis in my career, that broker's license is not on my list. It is a very, it's a lot of work and it requires a lot of time. I still got to build up Genesis. I still got to help the people that I already have. <laughs> I still got to finish my goals and what I need to do. And then maybe we can revisit that whole idea of reading again a broker's license. So it really is dependent on what you want. Now, if you want something really just be brutally honest, have rules. Seriously, have rules for yourself. I know it sounds really dumb and childish, but establish rules. I have reader rules. And if it doesn't fit the reader rules, I'm not gonna do it. And I don't know if that helps, but. It helps a lot. So Rita, like as <laughs> You know, entrepreneurs, a lot of entrepreneurs have lists, right? Like, you know, we have like hundreds of things to do, right? And every day, like you, you might go to a list, you get the number 10, and then you see, oh man, number, number 15 is still on my list, right? I need to do number 15, but I can't because it's not in top, my top 10. How you deal with like having something on your uh, quote unquote list all the time is important, but not important enough for you to do. Like, how do you, like, how do you manage that? Like without driving yourself crazy? Like this is on my list, it's still on my list. I get to get off while, well, I want to, but I can't because it's, not, it's still not priority enough. So I got really good advice and I actually have applied it to my business. I only do three things a day, just three, okay? If it doesn't fit the three things, I'm not gonna do it. So I actually have a content day and I just focus on content for all of it, all social media. I have a, you know, network day. So three days, just three things a day and then stop. 
I know in real estate, you're supposed to be on, do these things all, like there's a thing called um, prospecting. You're supposed to do that all the time. Here's the thing. There's different kinds of prospecting. There's different kinds of networking. There's different kinds of outreach. I don't like cold calling, so I'm not going to do that at all. But I've gained interest through social media. So my prospecting is usually through social media. My prospecting is largely through talking to people online or through other agents. So, but just pick your three things. The three, those are the three things you do that day and then stop. And I thought that was the best advice anyone has ever given me when it came to business. Just do three things. Those are the three projects for that day and that's it. Anything beyond that three, unless it's essential, don't do it. So if it's not essential to your business for those and it falls into those three things, don't do it. Three things, three projects. So how do you deal with like as an entrepreneur? I'm sure you get like calls, emails all the time. Rita, meet me for this. Rita, meet me for that. Oh, if you sign on with me, I'll increase your sales by 10,000%. How do you <laughs> deal with, how do you deal with all this noise and how do you like, did I crush it and, and tell them everyone, a lot of people know, because I think it's important to tell people no more than you say yes. How do you do that? And I agree. Um, I never, okay. So you, like I said, you and I are active on social media. And the one thing we do see a lot is those people who send us, you know, DMs on, if you follow Timothy, Timothy will help you get 10,000 followers. No offense to Timothy, that ain't gonna happen. So it went again, those are the points of the reader rules. If my emails largely consist of education and clients, if there's anything involving a networking event, I tend to plan those months in advance because I need time to prep for those. Remember, I am an introvert. I can't do anything like on a whim, um, which is a benefit because it teaches you about, you know, time management. But <laughs> Um, I do it months in advance. If it's something that is not important, you know, and you can measure what's important and what's not. If once again, those importance are those rules. If it doesn't fit the Rita rules or the Genesis rules for Rita, I won't do it. Now, as for emails themselves, if I, it's just depending on what you're looking for. It depends on what your standards are and what your, what your barrier is. There are coaches out there that will message me and say, hey, if you let me coach you, I can get you a million dollars in six months. Now, we all know that's not that that might be great, but I'm going to be sacrificing like 70 hundred hours a week just to get that million dollars. And I'm not going to remember my name. So if I know that that guy can give me that for, in six months, but I'm risking all of this to get there, I'm not going to do it. So it really is down to your standards. And for me, time is an important standard. You know, if it doesn't fit this goal or this time, I, I can't do it now. I do decline a lot of offers and that's not just to be mean or vicious. It's just, it just doesn't fit. So if it doesn't fit you and it doesn't fit your life or where you see yourself going, don't do it. Just say no. How old am I? I swear I'm in my thirties. <laughs> <laughs> Rita, what, what's your favorite social media platform right now? I do like Instagram and Twitter. TikTok, I play around with a lot. I'm trying to get the hang of it, but Instagram and Twitter are like my, my, my big buddies. Nice. Rita, so, you know, you know, a lot of people say, you know, you're an entrepreneur, don't quit, keep on going, you know, keep grinding, you never give up. But should someone actually like give up for me an entrepreneur? Is there a time where you say, okay, I've had three businesses that have all failed. Nothing's going right. Like, so someone say, okay, this isn't for me. Or she just like keep grinding, so to speak. When's that stopping point? Or should so, that be a stopping point? Genesis and real estate are actually my, combined is my fourth business. Okay. I have learned, are they, are they building a business or are they on a grind? Are they on a hustle? So there's a difference between a business and a hustle. So that's really the first thing they need to learn. So if they're doing this for a hustle, which is all they're talking about is making money, and they're not building a business, they're just hustling. 
a business has a foundation. A business has to be nurtured. A business has growth. A hustle does not. That's the difference between a business and a hustle. Now, if someone says, I've been doing this for this long and I haven't seen anything from it, but then that means, that tells me that either are they focusing on the money or are they focusing on the business? If they're focusing on the money, they're not going to make any. If they're focusing on the business, if they're focusing on the business, then they'll be just fine because they know what to nurture. My next question would be, and this is where you need to know if you could pack it in or not. Are you changing the goal or are you changing your plan? That sounds really dumb to ask the distinction. But if your goal, let's say my goal is to run a real estate tech company for farmers. If someone does that, that's really cool. But if someone decides to run a real estate tech company for farmers and they focus mostly on agricultural sales and development, but all they've done is just talk to farmers, then what's the plan? If the goal is that, are you, are you, which one's more important? The plan, which is you talking to farmers every 15 seconds, which is great networking, or is it the, the actual business itself? So the big question is, are you on your grind for a hustle or are you on your grind to build a business? If you're on your grind for the hustle, then stop. Don't do it. Just walk away, find a nice little job where you get a base plus commission and call it a day because that's a hustle. But if you're doing it for a business, you'll never stop. You know, this, are, like I said, this is a relationship. What are some tools that you use, like what productivity tools you use? Like in forms of software and stuff? Yeah, like Asana or Trello or like Google Calendar or anything like that. I am a big Google fan. So I do, I love my Chrome. It is my buddy. It is my friend. Um, Google. I do have something called, I'm old school, so I actually do have a whiteboard. If, it, if I can't feel the words, it doesn't feel real to me. So, oddly enough, I am a millennial. I was born in 1988, but I just, I'm not very good with it being digital completely. I'm very comfortable with writing things out because once I write it out, I'm, I'm feeling the, like I'm feeling the agenda on a screen. It does nothing for me. So my product, my products that I often use would be Google Chrome and my whiteboard that I got from Staples. It's really good. So just, I wish, like I said, there's really nothing fancy about, about <laughs> anything involving Genesis. It's very simple. It's focusing on making sure that, you know, if I, let's say if I go on a cruise in six months, which probably will not happen, but let's say I did, I know Genesis will be okay because I kept it very simple. Rita, it's just networking and have speaking, fun. Speaking of different generations, do you have to approach the way you sell a real estate differently based on the generation they're, they're in? No. Um, I try to have a base understanding of my business. So that way, no matter what generation I'm talking to, their respect and standards are the same. So I'm a millennial. My cousins are Gen X and my mom's a boomer. Okay. I have a sprinkle of silent generation in my family somewhere. They all get the same thing. They all are treated the same way because it's all this baseline of business understanding. So it doesn't matter if I'm talking to a Gen X or a Gen Z, if they all get treated the same way, they all get treated with the same respect. If your standards are fine, the generation doesn't matter. I have boomers that are my clients. And I have Gen Zs that, are, that, are my, that work with me. And they're a little more social media addicted than I am, but 
I have respected the fact that that's how they process. But it really is down to your standards. That's really how business works. I mean, I, I don't know how everyone else does it, but you, there has to be boundaries. But you also have to know what you bring to the table. And if that doesn't translate in all walks of life, then I'm doing something wrong. I shouldn't have to accommodate based off of this or that. So someone's like, say if someone's from Europe, obviously I'm gonna talk to that person in a way that's befitting their culture, but the consistency would be the same as someone I'm talking to lives in Utah, <laughs> okay? The standards have to be the same or similar to reflect the standards of my business. Rita, so earlier you talked about only doing three things a day, but how do you pick mm -hmm. those three? How do you pick those three things? Like do you is like you pick them like the day before, weeks in advance. Like how do you pick only three things, and how do you know those are the right three things to work on that day? So, you know, I have Genesis and real estate at the same time. The three things is always one thing Genesis, one thing real estate, and one thing that overlaps both. I plan it a week and a half in advance, depending on circumstances, but usually it's a week and a half in advance. Okay. And that's how it works. Um, it's worked so well that I've gotten a lot done. Um, I have more time for myself. I get to read and study more because I know these things, these three things were accomplished on these designated days. Remember, we're introverts. So time management is important to us. Because remember, everything we do, the minute we step foot, you know, in that space, either social media or physical, we have to pack a punch. So what we do behind the scenes reflects that. So my those are that's how I manage and schedule those three things. Like I said, unless it's an emergency. And it has to be like CNN worthy. <laughs> That's the only way that will change. But outside of that, three things. So Rita, there's people out there who like say, you know, you gotta have work-life balance. You know, Elon Musk famously works 80, 90 hours a week. Other people work 40, 50 hours a week. Some people like, I have a friend, he works like 21 straight days, take three days off. Well, how do you, what's your secret to this? Do you have a plan for this or you just go, go, go? So, Biggest fear is burnout. You never want to burn yourself out because you tend to not enjoy the process. I have learned, once again, remember, these are things that we've learned through the time. I give myself one day off a week. So Sunday is literally my day of rest. I turn off my phone. No one exists. And I go to bed. Um, I have... During the week, I'll have moments where I like, I have off phone day, off phone hours, which means I physically turn off my phone and I'm not on it until maybe at this time when the phone turns itself back on and the alarm goes off. So that's how I keep my work-life balance. Is there such thing as a work-life balance? No, it does not exist at all. I learned that excuse me, <laughs> from high school. I have learned there's no such thing as work-life balance. And the reason why I say that, that high school taught me that is because even when I left school and went home, I still had to study. I still had to prepare for exams. I still had to do all this stuff before I went back to the school. What I learned is how to manage where I get a break, but there's not a real balance. Yeah, it makes me ask so many people nowadays, they're like, that while they'll be like, you know, this is the chunk generality. They work a nine to five and do nothing else. They do nothing else, extra at work. And they're and asking how can they get a little raise? I can't get raised at promotion. Well, what are you doing? I work a nine to five, I do my job. Well, what's, what are you doing that, you know, makes yourself look better than your competition in your job, right? And they don't, and they don't get it right. You got to put some extra work in somewhere. I have a great, I have an amazing grandfather and my grandfather did this, which is really cool. 
he works. He comes home and he hasn't done anymore. He's like been retired for years. He works, he comes home and he goes online and he, you know, looks at tech, you know, and he'll go to work the next day and he'll discuss what he saw in technology or what he studied. My grandmother did the same thing. She worked in a hospital. She would go to the hospital, come back, and she would read all these medical books. <laughs> she would do her jewelry. She would do all that. And what I learned from that is as long as you're thinking and as long as you're moving, there's always an opportunity to learn and grow. Nine to fives, I have nothing against nine to fives. I have plenty of people in my family that are nine to five. But what makes them unique and what distinguishes them between everyone else is the fact that they do after five o'clock. They're reading, they're studying, they're, at, they're taking classes, they're going to the gym. It's what they do when no one's looking, in my opinion, is what makes them great, which is why I do not believe that this is thing as an actual work-life balance because it's, you're always doing something. My mom was a teacher for like almost 20, 28 years. And when she wasn't at school, she was reading, she was studying, she was, you know, doing lesson plans. She was treating her kid as a guinea pig when she was practicing her lesson plans. You know, she was always doing, sorry, allergies. She was always doing something to prepare for what's next, you know, like I said, when I got into entrepreneurship, it wasn't just one thing. It was watching my family. It was being part of that process. And they taught me the importance of learning, knowledge, education, but community and support. Yeah. Nine to fives are great, if there's, but it's a job if you're not contributing to anything for yourself afterwards. It's a career if you're building on it. And, and nowadays, I mean... You can learn anything you want to on YouTube, right? Or Google, or you know, you want to learn Python, you know, I'm sure there's a YouTube channel. You want to learn how to, you know, sew dresses. I mean, there's so much free content, free things out there. Like, I think even like Harvard and Yale, like gives all the courses for free, you know, I mean, the knowledge is unlimited out there. You just got to want to Exactly. It. So it doesn't make, and like I said, I've had jobs. I don't want people thinking that most entrepreneurs just jump into entrepreneurship. No, I've had jobs. I have a resume. I had a W-2. You know, it's not like I've never worked before. It's, but it's not the job that's the problem. People think that the problem is the job. The jobs are not the problem. It's, it's me. I always believed in the idea that anyone can contribute to the growth of something. And when you have a job, everything's already established. You have the book in your hand. You already know what the workplace is like. You already know what all this is like. What do you bring to it? Okay, I used to work at Fossil. And the one thing I remember at Fossil is, you know, the, the, the culture around watches. Okay, so I know everything from automatic watches to mechanical to digital. Congratulations. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> I, can, I, can change, I can still change a battery. But what am I contributing to, to Fossil to make Fossil great? And then I got to wait for someone else to retire for me to do anything. And I'm stuck with another layer of, of work that I didn't contribute to. And I'm competing with people who essentially are all doing the same thing I am. So there's not a real growth or, comp or contribution to it. But if I took Fossil, let's say I stayed at Fossil and learned about, which is what I actually did, and learned about the importance of logistics and applied that to my side hustle or my side business, then there's a shift in what we do with that bit, with that job. Now it's a career because now you learn about logistics. Now it's something else. If you're going to take a nine to five, that nine to five needs to be a lesson. That nine to five needs to translate into something. Even if you're not going anywhere with that nine to five specifically, at least take that knowledge and apply it somewhere. That's okay, good, that's my that that's the best way I can explain it. That's why I have a different interpretation of entrepreneurship than most people do. Like I said, my mom, my mom was a teacher. This was her base. <laughs> and she went off and she did, you know, ghostwriting. 
but her she taught me about the importance of having a base revenue and side revenues. And that was a that like I said, that was a that was a Catholic school teacher who taught me that. And she's an entrepreneur. It's what you do. That's why when you asked me any advice that I would I give people who are interested in entrepreneurship, what do you want to do? What what are you trying to address? Yeah, I, I know here in Seattle, like Amazon gets a lot of criticism for, you know, you know, some deserve, some not. Well, Amazon does a good job at, I know at least 10 people with startups who started Amazon, work Amazon for a couple of years, learn the Amazon system, learn AWS, learn all these like, you know, based knowledge and now they're out, you know, with startups, right? So Amazon does a great job like of doing that. Right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So... But Amazon did something that was really smart. Amazon started Amazon, I think it was an Amazon employee program that yeah. empowered their employees to become entrepreneurs because they were tired of them leaving. <laughs> yeah. So once again, they filled a void that was left when they left. Does that make any sense? It does. It makes a lot of sense. So how do we... So if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to find a way and you have to be empowered to do it. Like I said, entrepreneurship when like, like during the Great Depression is not that far different than entrepreneurship now. During the Great Depression, they filled a void. OK, they had to figure out what to do with these buildings or they had to figure out do how to take care of each other. So one person was the laundry lady and the person sold the apples lady exchange with the laundry lady so the laundry lady did the apple ladies clothes issue just like you do rita how do you have anybody on your team is this you by yourself right now majority of the operation is done by me I do have the Genesis network, which is a small group of people. And then I have the real estate group, which is through EXP. But most of it's managed by me. The podcast, content, <laughs> blog, <laughs> networking, it's all me. Yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be a lot, right? It could be a lot. Do I regret any of it? Nope. I love every minute of it. I love every mistake I've made, every um, article, every, I, I love the whole thing. I'm very proud of what I created and where it's going to go. But I'm also very proud of the people that I work with and that I work and that I help with, that I help because I know that I played a role in their success. Even if it's something really tiny, like um, there's this, uh, I bought a bag not too long ago. This is really, really girly of me, but I bought a bag not too long ago. And it was from a small business owner out in England. I know that my bag is helping her right now build and grow her business. Every time I talk about my bag. Every time someone sees my bag, and it's my work bag. It's a very standard, simple blue bag. It's nothing crazy. But I know that it contributed to something greater than me. And once again, that's part of the of service part. And that's the part of entrepreneurship I love is being of service. Knowing that you one day might be being in a documentary series about small businesses. And I'll say, remember as little people, is because I, in some way, shape, or form, was part of that. And that's the part I love. I love seeing you guys succeed. It puts a smile on my face. That is serious. Yeah, that is definitely one pro for me as being an entrepreneur. Like, you don't realize the, the amount of people you come across that you network with, you meet, that just generally great people, right? Doing great things, you know, where if you're not an entrepreneur, I would have met you, different people. So that is one pro of it. Exactly. And it all interconnects, you know, it's, once again, it's that genuine living, you know, and genuine, being genuine with your business. Knowing that, let's say, 
and this is actually happening. I have someone here who um, is doing very well in this business and he's looking to hire some employees. Knowing that I can say, hey, I can set you up with this person here that can help you with the HR part of growing your business. And I introduced you to makes me happy because you're helping him succeed and he's helping you succeed. Exactly. It's that so, connection. And that's important to me. If networking was like that, just that simple and not so chaotic, it would be great. Rita, is there anything that I should have asked you that I have not asked you yet? You can ask me whatever you want. I, I, there's nothing that's popping up in my head. Okay. All right, cool. Um, so let's go back to networking. So, you know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs, like, you know, they, they focus on building a product and they never network, they put stuff out there. Talk about the points of networking as an entrepreneur, of, of putting your idea out there and talking to multiple people. So the be basic way of putting this is separate the difference between network, uh, a, do you remember, okay, this is so long ago, but high school, high school taught you the difference between a friend and an acquaintance. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Network is similar to that. Your friends, people you trust, and hopefully, you know, you respect and everything, but then you have your acquaintances. Networking takes it to a different level. It is acquaintances with, an, with a common goal. Okay. There are acquaintances. There's people I know, but we don't share a common goal. Networking focuses on that common goal. Um, like I said, I'm a Marvel fan. So in the first Avengers, they were talking about the, the common, em common enemy. And at that time it was Loki. So <laughs> all the Avengers didn't see it that way. They kind of each had their own issues and their own egos. And when Loki did his little thing on the ship, I mean, on the aircraft carrier, they got together and focused on this common goal. That's networking. And how do you find those people that share your goal? What is your goal? If your goal is to help other people start businesses, you're going to find people that are largely big on education and resources. You know, most of the people I work in finance, they teach. That's what they do. Finance is the, the platform for it, but they teach. They teach people how to budget. That's really what they do for a living. And then once they've reached the point where they can handle a budget, then they introduce mortgages and loans. So that's really what networking is. Finding people that share a common goal or mission, all y'all join forces and make it happen, okay? You find your Thor, <laughs> your Captain America, <laughs> your Iron Man, and you guys get together. And when things arise or when things happen, you, you have that, that network. And that's really how networking works. It's basically what it is. Just... More sophisticated high school. So do you have a favorite Marvel character? When I was a kid, it was Hawkeye. Um, partly because Hawkeye and Hawkeye Pierce from MASH share the same name. And I thought they were both really cool. As an adult, it is... The Scarlet Witch and Loki. Yeah, mine has always been Spider Man. He's always been number one for me, Spider Man. Well, it's nice to know you're a fan of New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I grew up reading all, all the comic books. Yeah, I remember like like being in the, in the comic book store, going from you know book to book, you know, trying to hide out as long as I could before I got caught reading for free. Yep, I remember those days too. Do you, you know what's so sad now? Because that what they have now is the um, there's like very few old school comic book stores in New York that they had to be protected. 
so this actual, there's an actual group in New York that gives them like a monthly stipend or something to these comic book stores to keep them going mm. because they don't want them to close because you can't find them. Anymore. Most of them, you order them online. Yeah. That's too but bad. I, but I'm, like I said, you learn about business, not from school. You learn about business through experience, but you also learn what you want. That's really the problem with when people are interested in becoming an entrepreneur. They, they like the title. They like the image. They like, they see all these people like Oprah and Tyler Perry, but they don't realize the work. I mean, Tyler Perry lived in his car. Yeah, they think six, they, they think six. They think six months later they'll be like a millionaire. Exactly, and they hear all these little people going, "Well, if you join me, we can do this in six months, and I can get you to a hundred k." But you don't understand what it takes behind the scenes to get them to that. You don't. It, that's really what people don't discuss. They don't discuss the work. They don't discuss the process, and the process is the fun part. That's just, that's just how I see it. But networking is a sophisticated form <laughs> of high school. <laughs> Rita, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Well, the Genesis home for all of it. Uh, Rita A. Parker for all of it. If you type in Rita Anthony Parker, I pop up. I had to put a middle name on there because there's plenty of Rita Parkers out there. <laughs> so um, I used one of my middle names and it's Rita Anthony Parker. And it's I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. What am I missing? Snapchat, yeah. which I should get more active with, but I haven't recently. Um, and oh, I'm on Clubhouse. I actually just signed up for Clubhouse and I really do like it. It's so Rita, not half bad. I asked you before, what, what's your favorite platform? My next question is what platform, what social media platform are you have, do you have the most fun on? Twitter. Twitter. And here's the thing. If I can give anyone advice on social media, I am not a social media expert. I do not pretend to be. Find your, people say find your niche. I hate the word niche. That's like, that, that word, it bugs me. But there's a great thing about social media that I've learned is find your corner of social media. So I <laughs> have... Because of I'm in real estate and I have to be active, I have like this nice little group of people called the Sussex Squad. I have, I have um, real estate Twitter. And then like they have like these little like different pockets of Twitter. And for some strange reason, I managed to find my own little corner <laughs> on social media that I enjoy. And don't focus on the followers. I know people look at that very quickly. They look at likes and followers and things like that. Don't do that. It's, it's, it's nauseating and it's not realistic. Most of those people that follow you are just following you because they want followers. You know, it's about the content. It's about what message do you want people to know about you and your business? If you're focusing on, I got 15 billion followers on Instagram. I'm like, so cool. Remember, portion of those people are bots. Yeah. Another people are following just because they need the numbers. Some of them probably be friends or family and some of them are haters. You know, that's not, it, the important thing is, is your message getting across? I've seen people with nine followers on TikTok and they've done very well just making sure that people know that their beauty supply business is doing, is, is selling weave, wigs hair stuff <laughs> you know focus on the message i think we like i said these are things that we get lost in so that's why 
You, you, but you, you, Twitter, Twitter is my friend. Twitter, yeah. A lot of people don't know this, but uh, eight, there's a big community of, of, on HR for Twitter, right? A lot of HR professionals on Twitter for some reason. But you made a good point. There is a lot of trash on, regardless of social media, TikTok, Snapchat, LinkedIn, whatever. There's a lot of trash. You have to ignore that, look past that, and focus on the positive. There's a lot of stuff you don't stuff on there. Like, like people a lot will say, oh, TikTok is like young females dancing on blah, 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 trash. But there's a lot of good stuff. Like, one guy I follow, I always talk about him. He's like 67 years old. He's a psychiatrist. Every day, he does a little dance. It does like a little mental health tip, right? In English and Spanish, right? There's another lady who does like self tips on LinkedIn tips on TikTok, right? And there's a lot of stuff across exactly. the social media platform. You just got to find it. And But this trash, right? there's a lot of, you know, like negative people like you want to bring you down, but you just got to look past it, right? Best you can. Exactly. The cool thing is someone put on, and I'm trying to find, I think it was a, a friend of mine from, from high school. And she said, you know, Rita's Instagram is like Rita's office. Just knock on her door and ask her a question. So for a week, I had a bunch of people messaging me real estate and business questions. And they said, and they hashtagged <laughs> Rita's office. And all these did was just ask questions. And I was like, where are they coming from? So they said, oh, we got it from our friend Stace. So I contacted Stace and said, you called it by office? She said, yeah, okay. So I answered their questions and everything. But it really is down to what you project. If it's, if you're projecting, you know, fakery, you're going to get fake people if you're just being yourself be yourself that's why i like those affirmations and i like you know my little tips on real estate because sometimes these are things that people don't know you know these are things that when people are having a bad day they're probably gonna want to hear it you know the world is real but my page doesn't have to be that crazy that's something i don't people realize too when they first started social media like a lot of people start social media they do like content oh no one's following me no one's like it well, I could be wrong, but Facebook, LinkedIn, they don't really tell you who views your content, right? Like you can, yeah, like you can scroll past them, look at them, and it might do something for them. That, but this because, like, you have no idea how many people look at your content, you know, just because you don't know, really like the views. I mean, you have no idea who's looking at it until someone like email you later on. Hey, Rita, man, thanks for talking about this, right? You have no idea. You're like, you see, right. you gotta keep on pushing and, it out there. Yeah. And what I learned, and I think I learned this from, because you and I are both on Founders Live. One thing I did learn was the importance of language. And I think if the language and the communication is there, and it's there in a way that makes them feel comfortable having those conversations or welcoming to those conversations, it makes your business a little bit more comfortable. I know it sounds really weird and it sounds odd to say this, but I try to make social media feel like you're on like the front porch of a family house and you all are just talking while you're eating some like while you're eating some gummy bears. <laughs> and if I can project it that way, that they can go underneath my page and go, you know, Rita, I really don't want to stay at my mama's house that much longer. How do I get out of here? Well, did you save? No, but I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but knowing that they felt feel comfortable having that conversation with me on such a public facing platform means I'm doing something right in my job and in my business. So Rita, we're, 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 this is a great conversation, great talk. And I thank you for your time, but we'll come to the end of our talk pretty soon. Can you give us any wisdom mm -hmm. or advice on anything you want to talk about? In general, enjoy the process. Stop trying to force it. If it's not natural to you and to your journey, don't force it. I think you and I both understand the importance of when you force an issue or you force an idea that's not ready for its time or not, or the time's not ready for it. Um, that's, that's my big thing. Trust the process. The process is more fun than, than the destination because you at least get to know that you've made it. Rita, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. All right. Bye. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.